Hello, Internets. This is Fantastic Reviews. Welcome to the third episode of Fantastic Reviews, everybody. Your go-to for opinionated thoughts and quips on movies, video games, comics, and all of the things that we like to fangirl out about. I'm Joe, and I will be your host for this podcast. Joining me, as always, is our good friends of the Great White North, the land of maple syrup and Canadian bacon, Marcel. You know, in, in Canada, it's not <laughs> called Canadian bacon. It's Bacon, and it's not what you call Canadian <laughs> bacon. That's ham. <laughs> also joining us to add a little peach to this sausage fest is Jenna. <laughs> I've dated you both. That's really weird. <laughs> oh, that's not nearly as weird as you calling it out. <laughs> that's really, that's so weird, but hello. We're going to have some fun on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're already suggesting it. <laughs> All right. For this episode, folks, the movie we are going to be reviewing is Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. And I am beyond excited because I love the Star Wars franchise. Before we begin, I would like to warn everyone that there will be spoilers from this point on. If you don't want the spoilers or if you don't want the movie spoiled, pause the podcast, watch the movie and come on back. Don't worry. We'll wait. I mean, if you pause us, we're not going to sit here in awkward silence for two and a half hours. Right that now. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> Again, warning: there are spoilers ahead. I should get some like like the 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 sound like the the alarm sound from from the Death Star. It's like rrr, 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 <laughs> spoilers ahead. <laughs> that would be a nice touch. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it here. Enjoy the sultry baritones of sirens from the Death Star. Wasn't that fantastic? It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, boy. So, as always, we are going to start this podcast with the two-sentence synopsis. And for this episode, I choose Jenna. Go. God damn it. Uh, okay, <laughs> so orphan space girl meets a robot. Robot takes her on a creepy adventure where she meets friends. And friendship conquers all. <laughs> Why did you have to say it like Professor Frank from The Simpsons? Yeah. And she meets the friends! Laven. And... Ahoy! <laughs> Laven. <laughs> Seriously, a lot of movies these days are about just like, look at the power of friends! The magic yeah. of friendship! And there's a rainbow. There yeah. almost was a rainbow. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, all right. Uh, Star so Wars. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, what worked, what didn't work, uh, what did you like, what didn't you like. Who wants to go? Oh, I'll go. Marcel. I'm going to start ahead. this one. Okay. Go for it. So, <laughs> I, I like Star Wars, and I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan, and I'm not one of those people who who is so hugely into the the extended universe, but I have still yet to shake the whole extended universe is no longer canon thing. It really bothers me that that's been retconned. So a couple <laughs> things first. One, Finn. One of the two main characters wielding a lightsaber. No Jedi training, no force powers, doesn't seem to be force sensitive in any way, shape, or form, and he's throwing that lightsaber around, and here's the thing. I I think it's kind of cool that you get to see the lightsaber used outside of what it's traditionally used for. That's great. Mm. Um, and I can also understand that as a stormtrooper, he would have had combat lessons and training on on hand-to-hand -hand combat with a, a number of weapons. I'm sure swords are one of them, which is great and fantastic and all. But the whole thing was, like, the, the whole, in the lore, that... The lightsaber was the weapon of the Jedi, and only the Jedi could master it. And so I, I don't know if that was like a, a physical capability, maybe the gyroscopic uh, vibrations within it that, you know, once it's turned on, it makes it hard to wield or, or what have you. I don't know. But it did kind of bother me that here's this guy who's never seen a lightsaber before, let alone turned one on and flung it around and killed things with it. And he, he's kicking ass with it. What the hell? 
<laughs> that doesn't work for me. You know what else doesn't work? The fact that, well, what's your name? Daisy Ridley, Ray. She, she's clearly force sensitive. We don't know what her, her tie into Luke Skywalker is or, or any of that sort of thing. It could be anything. But for all intents and purposes, she was this orphan girl on a desert planet that's not tattooing. Never <laughs> been exposed to the force that we know of. All of a sudden, she can use it. How long did it take Anakin and Luke and, and, and all the Jedis and Sith out there to learn how to manipulate people and do the force suggestion, force push, force pull, force jump, force anything? And all of a sudden, she just decides, you know what? I think I'm going to be good at this. And she you, is. You know, I have to interject there because from watching the previous movies, Luke does like a training montage for an hour. <laughs> with with Yoda in a swamp. And but you don't actually see how long that he's training, though. That could have been <laughs> months. It could have been years. Could have been anything. That's true. But also, to, but also to that point, she doesn't really use the Force overly much until she gets to Maz Kana's uh, cantina <laughs> little thing that she's got going on. I don't can't say her name. Maz Maz's Maz. thing. Maz. And she's not really the one who's actively doing that. It seems to be a trigger. Uh, the presence of. In her nearbyness of all of Luke's stuff, that seems to help trigger it, and maybe it's just because she is force sensitive, so it reached out to her because she's the only one there. Um, but the only time we really see her, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the only time we see her do anything with the force is when she when she mind wipes that stormtrooper. But she only did that because, basically, uh, what's what's his name? Uh, bad guy's name? Why can't I remember his name? Kylo, Kylo Ren. Ren. Kylo Ren was like mind raping her beforehand, and she fought him off. I mean, uh, obviously, the, I mean, the, the pilot at the beginning who was also getting his mind tortured there, he, you can feel it happening because he's obviously in pain. So, I mean, it's not necessarily that she's good at the force. It's just that she it's instinctual and she just tried to do whatever was there to get him out of her mind. She so does like more of a, the force, though. She like later yeah. on, like, I mean, she she does fight back and she uses she Kylo does. Ren's whatever voodoo hoodoo on back on him. Yeah. And then she, she force suggests the stormtrooper to let her out. Mm -hmm. um, but when she fights Kylo Ren, like she uses the force pull to grab the, the lightsaber, but not only just grab the lightsaber out of the snow, Kylo Ren is also force pulling. So she uses the force like twice as hard and yanks it out of the snow away from him into her hand and then she starts to to do all kinds of crazy sort. How does she know how to yeah. sword fight? Well, I mean, she did grow up on a desolate desert planet as a woman, so maybe <laughs> she was trained to fight <laughs> off crazy ass people. I mean, that is a good point because you know, in the beginning of the movie, you know, we see her fighting off those scavengers, just beating the crap out of them with, with her the staff. Bow staff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, she just maybe not trained in a, in a lightsaber or sword, but maybe it's as simple as don't let the shiny part touch you so you don't die. And that but was maybe, just her <laughs> don't let the blue blowy part. But I'm thinking that it could maybe be like kind of a, a – almost like a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. almost like something that just kind of comes out under duress. And I, you know, I don't remember because – God, the, the prequels were kind of hard we're to say. Just, just, just assume the prequels. the prequels don't exist. I love the prequels. <laughs> Fuck I mean, you. <laughs> I, they had, you know, they had some good, uh, they had some good moments in them, and I don't remember exactly, but I think I, I, I kind of feel like I remember a scene where Qui Gon's talking about, oh, hasn't you, hasn't, hasn't anything ever happened around Anakin? You know, things happen that you can't quite explain. You know, and I'm thinking, well, maybe. You know, it's one of those things where it's a defense mechanism. She's under duress and like it's just an instinct that she never knew that she had just kind of kicks in because now she's around all these force users. So what you're saying is she's essentially a super Saiyan. Pretty much. I guess so. If she collects all seven <laughs> Dragon Balls. Just... <laughs> then she'll wish for more Friends. <laughs> friends. <laughs> Friendship is magic. Maybe yeah, she'll, I, she'll I don't get it. I mean, I I 100 agree with you. Maybe under duress, she she can use the force, but I see it more like a under duress. She she unleashes like this huge shock wave of force or something. But I mean, Jedi go through a lot of training through a lot of years just to learn how to uh, use the power of suggestion 
Or even the force push isn't something that that comes easily. Like Anakin went through a lot of training just to to learn basic force stuff. His stuff when he was under duress, he had dreams of the future. Okay. Correct. I, I do have one other thing to, to maybe maybe this will help. And it's not wasn't ever part of the of the series. It was just something I had read uh, somewhere that each generation of Jedi becomes exponentially stronger than the previous Jedi. Because if you look at it, Anakin in his time was the most powerful Jedi that you could possibly imagine. Um, he didn't know that, but he was. He killed all the other Jedi. He, <laughs> you know. But not only that, then when Luke came, he was stronger than him. Now we have Rey, who may or may not be related. I'm just off to the side. But it seems like every the one has to be stronger than the last the one to get out of the matrix of the Star Wars universe. Um, so maybe it's not so much that it, it's not that she, she would require as much training because she would in order to control her powers, but she's not really controlling them at this point. She's just kind of firing off on all cylinders that she can possibly manage without really knowing what to do. Um, and sometimes some of those, some of those things she's trying land and good for her. But, uh, so it's it's possible that that's just – she is so powerful and so strong with the Force that she doesn't necessarily have to have as intense training just to unlock her powers. Because even Kylo Ren says that she's stronger than she knows. I mean she fought him off without knowing what to do. So she's either stronger than him or on his same level without any training whatsoever. Imagine what the Force she would – what a Force she would be with some training. So yeah. just a thought and a theory. I mean maybe it's complete – crap but it is something to think about because each jedi we've seen has been stronger than the previous jedi i don't know if i agree with you because luke didn't necessarily beat darth vader he convinced darth vader to come to the light side sort of did he use jedi magic to do so no he no. We don't know no i yeah, no, he didn't but still <laughs> he bitched out like the little bitch he is. <laughs> Daddy, no! We oh, all my agree. son, don't hurt him! <laughs> and then they were all friends again, and he was a good guy, and they took off his helmet, and then he died, and he came back as Hayden Christensen as a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> oh. there, there's been some really strong Jedi and Sith throughout history, that, and I don't know if necessarily each generation is stronger, but um, I do like the idea that Rey has inert talents that are, are you know, it, with refinement would get better. I don't like how good she is unless they prove one of the theories that I'm really fond of to be true. And that is this. And I'm going to tell you this. I don't remember where I read it. Okay. But listen. So Luke Skywalker is, is doing this whole um, new Jedi order. And he's mm -hmm. training all the new Jedi. Kylo Ren was one of him. Or Ben, ben Solo was one of his Padawan learners. Yes. So Ben Solo, for whatever reason, gets gets seduced by the dark side, and he he you know he he starts killing all the the other Jedi off and he, whatever. So here's the the theory though. The theory is that Rey was a very young Padawan at the same time. In fact, not just any young Padawan, but uh, Ben Solo or Kylo Ren's cousin, and they were very close all growing up. And when he turned to the dark side, he couldn't kill. Ray. So what he did, and Ray is clearly Luke's daughter in this theory. So what he does to, to hurt Luke, because that's really what it comes down to. He wants to hurt Luke, but he can't bring himself to kill Ray. He takes Ray, and he lets Luke believe that Ray is dead. He takes Ray to Jakku, wipes her mind because he's got those crazy why like mind fuck things. So she doesn't remember, and then he fucks off because. He, I don't know, there's some kind of connection between the two when they meet up again. Yeah. And that's uh, my one of my favorite theories. I'm not going to deny that there's definitely a connection there between the two of them because there is. But I don't know if that's just because of the Force and, or, and there's so few Jedi that there is like a strong bond there. But I don't really buy it. Only because of the age difference in, at the time. Because if she was a young, if she was, because when we see her get abandoned, she is to be like maybe 10 years old. and Not even. Not even 10. So in order for him to have abandoned her there, I mean, he would have, he would have been, 
I mean, they have to be similar-ish in ages. He's only probably a few years older than her. Well, he, I, I believe guessing. it that he's got so. at least 10 years on her. You think so? Yeah, I, I think don't. So. I can't really tell. I can't really gauge their ages here. I'm, I'm assuming that Ray he's... is probably like early 20s, maybe, maybe 19, 20 or early 20s. And Kylo Ren is probably... 25? I it would like seem late, like Kylo late 20s, Ren. early 30s to, to me. Yeah, it would it would seem like Kylo Ren definitely has some time on her because when at the time that, you know, all the all the the new Padawans are are slain, you know, I, he he's becomes the leader of the Knights of Ren. I mean, he's got to be like a teenager and and we see from the the scene on Jakku that uh Rey's really young. I mean, I would she probably put her him. around like 8. Yeah. You know? It's a cool theory. I just don't know if I buy it so much because I mean, you just killed like fifty kids. How close really are you to your cousin? Well, he does struggle with with the light side, right? Like they it's really true. show that he's like he has to 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 call out to Darth Vader and say, "Give me the strength to stay to the dark side," because I feel like I'm being pulled back. So, I mean, at that very early age and very early on in his dark side career, where you know this is still new to him, clearly because That's he's true. turning against everyone, he might not be strong enough to to turn his back on the one person that he related to the most. Uh, okay. But even that almost doesn't make sense, though, because if he if he knows the Darth Vader story, then he knows that Darth Vader almost pretty much repented at the end. And I think someone actually had there was an actually an article about that, and the the whole Kylo Ren's thinking towards that is that he was seduced by the light side, and that was a tragic tragedy, mm. and that's what he's trying to rectify now. Now, whether or not that's true. Or, I mean, it was an article that someone said they interviewed one of the writers or something. And whether or not that's that's actually accurate and his actual feelings towards it, it makes it interesting because if Kylo Ren thinks, well, he was seduced by the light side, just like the Jedi, just like uh, someone could be seduced to the dark side, well, that's that's something that can't, that can't stand, you know. Um, interesting theory, though. I mean, it's interesting theory. I just – because especially if he was a teenager and she was only like 8 to 10 – how close could they really have been? I mean, I have cousins that are younger than me, and I'm just – I mean, I wouldn't kill them if I was a Jedi. But, like, we're not that close. So if he went full on dark side and just murdered a bunch of people, I don't know that I would believe that was the one person he would spare. If there was – even, I mean, especially if there was, like, a melee going on and just just body parts flying, you know. It's an interesting theory, and I know there are a lot of them out there. And personally, I don't really like to read those because, I mean, yeah, it's it's fun to speculate, but I, you know, I like to be surprised, and I like I kind of like let to like I like to let the story do its thing. Yeah, you know, without going in with any expectations one way or the other. So, but but that is a very uh, it's a very interesting point, and I do have to agree with Marcel's point that you know it is. It kind of doesn't make sense that she would be able to force pull the uh, uh, the lightsaber out of the snow because there is so much training that goes into that. So that is kind of a, a, a weird see, inconsistency, it, I guess. See, that didn't bother me because I felt like the entire movie leading up to that point made sense for everything else. Again, she was under duress. This was a very dire situation. She just saw her friend, someone who had saved her. She, he may be dead. He may be dying. Um so I think more more than that, it wasn't necessarily something she could do all the time. But in that situation, under the stress she was in, I mean, people can lift cars off of their children. <laughs> You're telling me she can't she can't force pull a lightsaber well, in a desperate situation to try to save herself and her friend. And I think that's why it didn't bother me because that was my interpretation of it. Is just that in this situation, she needed to have it happen, and it needed to happen now. So and under this duress, was the only it is. Thing. A defense mechanism. Yeah, and, and that's what I took away from it is that not necessarily that she was – that she knew exactly what she was doing. She just knew she could not let him take that lightsaber or she would have no chance of escaping with her life or her freedom and Finn was going to die. You know, They had to get out of there and that probably is the only thing that saved her at that point. And okay. that's why it didn't bother me. OK. Personally. OK. Well, what about, uh, what about you, Jenna? What, what kind of stuff did, did you think you liked or did you think worked, didn't work? Um, I really, I really enjoyed the characters that, that they made for us in this, in this movie. They, I felt like you got pulled in right away with, with Ray and you got pulled in with Finn. I definitely believed all of their motivation that that there was going on in here. So I think that worked very well. Just writing 
just the writing alone with the interpersonal reactions between the characters was just phenomenal to me because you really believed you believed Finn when he when he wanted to escape you you believed that it wasn't just uh, okay we need this guy to get out or oh, what can we do he he couldn't handle combat he didn't want to kill people you know he didn't want to kill innocent people and fight in a war that wasn't his war and you believed that because he wasn't just all right well he's going to turn he's going to turn into a good guy because that's what the plot says <laughs> and then his interaction with with Poe i mean they're they're in the they're, these are two guys in the midst of a combat situation who bond fairly quickly because you're it's your soldiers escaping, <laughs> you know? So even their reaction at the end when they finally meet up again and they hug each other, I, I just, these are men who knew each other for a total of 15 minutes, but went through such an ordeal in those 15 minutes that it, I mean, you, you see that with people returning from war all the time, just that you can bond so quickly over something. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect. I loved Ray's interaction with BB-8. I thought that was phenomenal. And I love BB-8. Um, but uh, and and the and what happened with uh, with Han and Leia too, I felt like was very organic and real to what those characters would have gone through with all of this, and stayed true to their characters as well. Because, I mean, hearkening back to the days of old, uh, to a little movie called Speed Two, um, <laughs> Speed it's relationships that happen. Under- I would love to see where this <laughs> this similarity is going. <laughs> Well, at the end of Speed, and it wasn't Speed 2, it was Speed, um, she says, relation, uh, Sandy Bullock says, uh, relationships that form under such intense circumstances never last. And their relationship definitely did not last. Though they loved each other, they had that on-again, off-again sort of romance that just, <laughs> they, you know, that continued to burn. And it was something you saw from the first movies, and by the first movies I mean the Ridge Tridge, that they were always constantly. Wait, wait! I'm just going to stop you right other. there. Did you just say a ridge tridge? A ridge tridge. Get out. No. <laughs> this is my house. You leave. <laughs> a ridge tridge. A ridge tridge. Uh, In the ridge tridge. Um, I think that's the first time, though, anyone has has linked a similarity with speed and the Star Wars franchise. Hey, or said a ridge it. tridge. You got no. Everyone says a ridge uh, tridge. <laughs> Everybody doesn't say you stole that from Cracked. I did. <laughs> they are everybody in my life that is important to me. Cracked, I love you. You're fantastic. <laughs> Anywho, I know they listen. They endorse listen. us. Endorse us. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. the, the writing. No, you're right. The the writing and the uh, uh, and the interactions and the uh, uh, the relationships that that are formed between everybody. You're right. I I, I do feel that the writing was yes. really like was really excellent and everything did feel organic. Nothing really felt forced or anything like that. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a problem that comes in with movies sometimes where you're trying, where they're, you're in these dire situations and you're trying to form these connections and, and you have to form them in a very short amount of time. Sometimes it's not believable in these ones. I, I felt like it was like, I didn't feel for a second. There was a misstep character wise. Um, that's not to say that there weren't plot holes, but, um, I feel like overall it was just, when you do the characters right and you have a, at least a solid story to follow, you can pretty much do anything. And they, they did. I think they nailed it pretty well. Um, one thing that is, again, we'll go, we'll go to inconsistent. Uh, one thing that did bother me, if we're talking about Kylo Ren and, and Rey as being uh, opposing force users, he kind of like mind like makes her go to sleep at one point. You'd think eventually he should have just done that to a bunch of people. Like, this fight's over. Blue, like that's a that's a crazy power to forget you have. Um, but then then again, he must ha- he might have to be really close to someone to do it. And you know he might like killing people, so that's something uh, that's too. A total cop out. But <laughs> but yeah, like if it's if it's something he could do once, it's like no, I just I can only do it mm. once per episode. It's I used it already. <laughs> um, so there was that. I didn't really care so much for the giant holographic image of the burned faced Snoke. Emperor Snoke. I felt like it was definitely and and how it should have ended did a really great <laughs> did a really great little uh oh, put on this where it's just Gollum sitting there and going my precious <laughs> and I was like yeah that's pretty accurate because it he didn't feel like a threat to me um, he was menacing like they did him very menacing but it was just I felt like that character was not done very well but we only saw him for like thirty seconds so I, He's the I, real I, I see what they were. I see what they were trying to do with it. They were trying to make him larger than life, and they were trying to make him seem seem like he's you know the big overlord of everything. But the minute that he became a hologram was the minute I was like, oh, 
Okay. Yeah. It would have been <laughs> well. It would have been cool if he was that ginormous. I knew he wasn't because so far in this universe we haven't seen anything like that. Yeah. Um. But it was. It was. Just, it was strange. The interaction between him and Kylo Ren was was good. I felt it was good, especially since we see Kylo Ren arguing with him, which is something we never saw Darth Vader really do. Um. So that was interesting. But I just didn't. I felt like everyone's talking about oh Snoke, and you see him, and you're just like, well crazy old man in a probably in a cave somewhere you know i'm what sure I we'll like? see what do you like what i like about the at least the, the snoke hologram is that you don't really catch on that he's actually a hologram till at the end and the yeah. rocks start falling through him and yeah, the yeah. reason why i like that is because it shows the progression of technology throughout the movies throughout all of the old movies whether it's the the prequels or <laughs> the orange tridge the holograms looked awful. They were distorted. They were kind of flickery. They are a little staticky. But that was a perfect hologram. You didn't know that he wasn't a giant, weird-looking alien fucker that right. just sat in a chair and bossed people around. I that thought that true. was great. That being said, I mean, they did hollow out a planet. So technology-wise, they're pretty on the ball. They, yeah, they made Which a lot also, of it. did no one realize they were hollowing out a planet? Like, that seems like a crazy thing to be able to hide for a while. Well, you know that's and and we'll get into this a little later in the podcast, but that's that's one of the common criticisms of the uh, of of this movie is that you know well how did all this go on and nobody in the Republic knew about it, you know? Well, because so it's, they told it's them kinda, they were building a disco light. Oh Everyone yeah, it could have been there, but bef- like the, that planet could have been weaponized before it was even uh, even populated, right? So I mean, those people who live there could they they it's, could all just be immigrants. It and, does look like. The only people who live there are the, you know, are, are the are the people in the, the uh, first order. It's basically yeah, the first order based of operations. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean the the operation of actually weaponizing a planet could harken back to the Empire. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's so. true. Um, that's ju- true. it did feel it did feel a little weird to me though. That, that I mean they did it great at the time. I didn't I didn't pay. T- I was like, oh my gosh, look at this crazy planet! It just killed four other uh, planets. It's still crazy. Still about that. It was awful. <laughs> So, I hated like, that. while I was first watching it, it was great. But then you think back to it and you're just like, well, <sighs> there had to be, like, so many supply ships and just a ton of just – where does the – I mean, you get to the core of the planet and now there's, there's the lava. <laughs> How do you deal with lava? And Maybe it's just, not a planet <laughs> at all. Maybe they terraformed a, a weapon. Maybe it was a weapon first. Mm, that is possible. Mm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I didn't I didn't even think of that. That is a good yeah. – That is a good. Uh, yeah theory there Joke. one of the things Stick some trees on it. yeah <laughs> the, the only uh the only things that really bothered me about the movie were i mean and and they didn't really bother me that much is like there there seemed to be a lack of explanation of a lot of things going on like uh how did the first order come around and how did the how did were they not all just destroyed did they just kind of fly off onto their own planet but I, I, I'm sure stuff like that is going to be addressed in future movies. I have I have faith. I have hope that they're going to do this. And if they're not, I'm going yeah. to be quite upset. And I think a lot of people are too. So I, I, I do think that they're going to be bringing up, you know, all the all the things like, how did this happen? Where did this come from? Where are these people? Who are they? You know, yeah. I, I think a lot of that's going to get answered in the future movies. So I'm kind of reserving judgment on that. But one of the things that I I loved about this movie is that they went back to – going to more practical effects as opposed to CGI. Mm -hmm. And um, reading an interview with J.J. Abrams, that's one of the things that he wanted to touch upon was to bring the series back to uh, more of a practical feel. It's not the prequels. We need to do CGI. (laughs) Well, it's not not so much that they're trying to distance themselves from the prequels. It's just that when when the prequels were made, CGI was like the thing to have in your movies. And George Lucas was always looking for the next big thing. The problem, though, is that he went overboard with it and everything just looked way too fake. And – Really, it's not totally his fault because in his mind, he's like, holy shit, you know, I can use this computer technology to show people worlds that are in my head that I I could not get out otherwise. But an unfortunate tragedy is that is is that, you know, it did go a little over. But um, what I found interesting, though, is there were a lot of practical effects that looked like CGI but weren't like um, 
quick like a uh, quick list of things like the the beast from the scene where BB-8 is trapped in the net on uh, Jakku. That beast was practical, no CGI. The other one, the other one is the beast that nudges Finn at the watering trough. Also practical, not CGI. And then, of course, BB-8 himself was a practical effect. There was no CGI at all. Whereas, like when we saw in the prequels, you know, R two D two's like rocketing around, like that was kind of ridiculous. But <laughs> there was but an BB-8 incredible himself. amount of technology that went into making the BB eight prop itself too, like. They no like barely anyone has been able to figure it out outside of actually getting the plans on how they did it. There's been a lot of like uh, prop designers and companies that tried to figure out how they made BB-8 because that was an actual sphere that rolled and that thing stayed on the top. Like that, that was real and that magnets. Yeah, <laughs> that that all that was all happened. That was real. Yeah. Well, that's how the Sphero toy is made. It's made with with magnet that keeps the head up, and it was actually pretty cool to play with. <laughs> I think, Cats love it. if I remember correctly, it, it has a lot of the uh, similar technologies that uh, that the uh, Segways have that keep them standing upright. The Juno Segways have like twenty three motors just to keep it standing up. Huh. Really? Did yeah. not know that. Huh. I thought they did, but I, I I definitely agree though. The the practical effects were just amazing, and I think it was a uh, amalgamation dynamics or technologies. They're they're a they're a special effects company who said, you know, in this day and age, you can't do just practical or just CGI. You have to have a nice blend of both because that's that's really the only way you're going to get a good you're going to get a good feel for a movie anymore. And I think Star Wars definitely proved that fact true. At least for this movie, we'll see what happens with Shadow Puppets in another movie when they run out of money. But <laughs> um, but they did. They had a really nice blend of both, and the blend that you saw didn't. You couldn't just go, oh, I, that's definitely CGI. Like you look back at the old movies now nowadays, and you look and you're like, oh, that's well, you could definitely tell. Look at all the crazy wiggly bits around it. That's definitely CGI. There's definitely a green screen behind him. I feel like this one, you d- you weren't taken out of the moment one way or the other. Yeah, there was very few. Um, there were very few scenes that had CGI in them that weren't in space. Pretty much all the space scenes were in CGI, mm-hmm. which is understandable. But there was very little otherwise that that wasn't like uh, um, most of the most of the ships that we saw were practical. And of course, uh, Maz was CGI, but that's because they really had no other way to make that work. You know, where you could see her walking around and doing all sorts of the other stuff that that we saw her do in the movie. So. Um, but I thought there was, yeah, but you're right. There was a very good, very, very good mix. And I think it gives a better look and a better feel to the movie when you actually have people that are, you know, playing around with switches and knobs and dials and rather than just kind of pretending, pushing their fingers on plexiglass, you know, it gives more, I don't know. It, well, it, also, it also gives you a focus. Like the actors can also focus on that too. And, and they have something like as a touchstone to, while they're doing things, it, it it makes it easier on the actors, I think. I mean, it makes it harder in other ways, too, because then you have to remember what dial to press. But I would – but, I mean, just being ha- – having something that you can physically touch and be in a room with makes it a lot easier rather than staring at a blank space to talk to someone and then you have to do it again with a green screen, you know? Yeah. So it, it, I feel like there's a more genuine reaction there because things that happen are actually physically happening. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so some good stuff, uh, some stuff that didn't work. Maybe things will improve on. Maybe stuff that uh, they'll address in the future movies. Oh, I'm sure um, they will. There are some. Uh, there were some other interesting. There, there's another interesting thing I wanted to talk about, and that there were a number of notable uh, celebrity cameos in the movie. Um, and I do have a, a small list here. I don't know if you guys knew these or not, but uh, like first on the list here, I hear there there were obviously there were a number of voiceovers in uh, Ray's vision sequence. Um, Actual voices from Mark Hamill, uh, Frank Oz, and Ewan McGregor. Um, I don't think they actually used uh, Alec Guinness's voice for Obi Wan. They did. Oh, they did. They did. They took a snippet of. So they used Ewan McGregor as part of it, but they actually managed to snip one of one of uh, Obi Wan's lines from from A New Hope, where it sounds like he's actually saying Ray. And that's what they did. He, they had his voice saying the word Ray. Oh, all right. Oh, that's cool. Technology. Right. <laughs> um, there was uh, Billy Lord in the movie, and she is actually uh, – she, she made a brief cameo as a resistance fighter. She's actually Carrie Fisher's daughter. 
I had no idea. And uh, for those of you who watched the the uh, the TV show Screen Queens on Fox, just sent Chanel number three with the buns in her hair. That's his daughter. <laughs> that is so awesome. I did not know that. I had no I, idea. I liked that show. I would yeah. like to better. I have if never heard of that show. Scream Queens? It's pretty campy. It is definitely a campy horror movie, funny spoof show. And uh, it was great. I, what, it could have done better if they had trimmed the episodes down a bit because it is a mini series. It, it could have stayed at like five episodes. It would have been fantastic. Yeah, I think they, they stretched that they, on way too much. They stretched it out too, too far. But, but she was great. I did, had no idea she was Carrie Fisher's yeah. daughter. No um, I did know Carrie Fisher's daughter was in the Star Wars movie, but I didn't know who she was. I was just yeah. an article I read. I was like, oh, Carrie Fisher's daughter made an appearance. I'm like, oh, that's neat. Yep, yep. Look at that. Um, the other one I thought was cool is uh, Simon Pegg is Uncar Plutt, who's the, <laughs> junk, the junk trader on Jakku. You couldn't really tell because he was covered in layers of costume and, and they uh, they modulated his voice down a bit, but he was in it. Um, Daniel Craig was the First Order Stormtrooper. They got mind tricked by Rand Starkiller Base. <laughs> he was actually in the Stormtrooper uniform. That is awesome. He was actually in costume. That was his voice. And uh, Kevin Smith was a First Order Stormtrooper during the attack on, on Maz's. He wasn't in costume, but they did use his voice. Who's so he, he, had, he, had, he had one line. It's, he said, we have incoming at 28.6. Move. Oh. That was it. That's all he said. I did not pick that up, but there was a lot but, of stuff going on. But even I would kill to at least have just one line in a Star Wars movie. Like, that's right? fantastic. All right. So the next thing I want to touch on in this uh, uh, podcast, and I know we're uh, kind of running high on time here, uh, so we'll try not to spend too much time on it. But I do want to address a couple common criticisms with the movie. Uh, the biggest one being that there are too many similarities, and it's the same basic story of A New Hope. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, Everything is a story of something else. I don't like. They did that on purpose. Yeah. So to me, what that was was they say, okay, we've got a brand new crew. With a brand new director, brand new writer, brand new, brand new owners doing a brand new Star Wars movie. We need this to be a throwback movie. So in order to really link this to the franchise that everyone loves, rather than being some considered just some one-off, we need to have elements that people really like from the other movies to really make it another movie. It's the same right. thing that goes for any sequel. So, for example, uh, if you've seen Austin Powers and the second Austin Powers, in the second Austin Powers, they use a lot of, they sort of play back on a lot of the, the jokes and gags from the first movie, and that's mm -hmm. what keeps it funny. That's what links it together. Same thing for this. This is a genuine sequel. They have to link it back to previous movies. What's the most beloved Star Wars movie of all time? A New Hope. So they need to really bring it back to that, sort of give you that same feeling, the same cuddle and you also have to tickle the funny bones of all the fans just so that way they, they feel good about the Star Wars movie for all the nostalgia that it has. Give them something new to chew on but not be so far off the base that, that they're lost. I think yeah. this is the exactly the way that they needed to do it to get everybody on board. Now, the problem with that is I don't agree with it. I don't like it. I think that this is a new chapter. It's good to have tie-ins and talk about the history but to make, you know, to really write the story to be as close to that to the previous ones was really a big mistake but i mean at this point i think it's easy to look past that because this movie was really about character development not plot development right and i mean i'll i'll agree with you to a certain point because they did tell a similar story but i felt like they told it in a new and exciting and fresh way I mean, there was a lot of the, the elements there were the same. I, I'll, I'll give you that. But I didn't feel like, oh, well, I'm watching everything point by point from the last movie. Um, I, I felt like the characters were very, again, I said the characters were very organic. Their story that was being told was very, while it was a throwback, while it was a callback to what happened before, it was very new and real because these characters were new. They weren't, I mean, they weren't, they didn't make you feel like, well, it's the same old ground that's been trod over and over again i like going into it and again I'll, I'll i'll say it i'm not a huge star wars fan like i can remember the movies because joe's made me watch them yeah. but and i did enjoy them although he doesn't let me watch them with him anymore because <laughs> i nitpick the crap out of it 
one, because there's points to be made, and two, because it's funny to watch him aneur- have an aneurysm every single time I do it. But, like, this movie, and while I feel like I could nitpick it if I wanted to, I don't feel like it needs to be. Um, I didn't mind that there was, that there was a, sto- a similar story being told. It didn't feel like the same old story again. And you had made a mention about Austin Powers using throwback jokes. That gets old. That gets so annoying, especially with a comedy. Like by the third one, everyone was like, "They just, they just did this in the last two. That's this sucks. Stop doing the same ones. Give us something new." Yeah. And I felt like this movie gave us something new, even though the general story was 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 still similar to to A New Hope. And um, but but it also had new elements to it as well. I mean, we have we have Ray. She's she's an orphan. Yeah, that's true. But we don't see her with her you know dead aunt and uncle somewhere. Um, she doesn't go train off into a into a swamp with some little yet thing. Yet. Well, uh, Luke Luke is not a little puppet thing though. But so he it's is different. off in some swamp place. All no, he's on an island. It's different. It's totally <laughs> it's an different. Isolated now. <laughs> area. But see, but they didn't put that in the movie. That was at the end. So we know something like that might be coming later. We we'll, we might see that. But we didn't we didn't have to spend all that time with that story it was it was a new it was a new branching story from a sim, from some similar uh, background and i liked that i don't i feel like it didn't alienate the fans but it also gave some people who are new to this because this is an entirely new generation going in for the most part um, there's people who don't who have not seen or are religiously addicted to star wars who can go and see this movie and get hooked and pulled in and it gives this fan something a nice touchstone to go into this new this new round of stories going, look, guys, we're not going to mess it up. And they, and they gave that to us. So I, I personally didn't have that criticism whatsoever. I got to be honest with you. I, I did not even think about any similarities or, or similar plot line about, you know, of the movie until after I had seen it and, you know, read some of the stuff online and someone said, Hey, it's the same, it's the same story as a new hope. And I'm like, huh? Right. And then- oh, well, yeah, it is. It is. It does kind of follow the same format, but it felt different enough that it didn't feel like it was a retelling of the same story. Yeah. Yeah. It, so I, I maintain that it was this movie's real purpose was primarily character development and not so much story development. We learned about the characters. We learn about sort of where they come from, what they're doing. And we, we sort of get it, get to know them as characters in this world. Right. And as far as story goes outside of this characters, not a lot going on. Yeah. Well, that being said, I mean, they have an an unlimited amount of movies to with which to unveil the plot with. We don't necessarily need a big, you know, a big plot reveal in this first movie that's just introducing us to this world. Well, I mean, again, introducing us because this is a new this is a new trilogy of movies coming out or however many they're going to make. So um, I, I think that was really smart on their part to do a character development story. Oh, For sure. They needed that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and that's why those characters are lovable. We love them now. So do love you think? Me. So do you think that this criticism is valid and detracts from the story in the movie, or do you think it really didn't matter? Depends I, I, on how much you love Star Wars. <laughs> I think it's a valid point. Like the the point being made is like, oh hey, it's a similar it's a similar story. Yeah, that's not now that's not a lie. But does it detract from the movie that's being told? No. Personally, for me, didn't take anything away from it. And like you, Joe, I didn't even notice the similarities until after the movie, after I had left. And that was, and that was because we read. I happened to read the probably the same article you did about it. It's like, hey guys, remember this? That's the same movie. But it didn't feel that way at the time, so I don't feel like it detracted whatsoever. That's what makes this so great is that we have very, very different perspectives. So we have, Jenna, your perspective as someone who's not a Star Wars fan coming in and watching this as this is just a movie. And then you have people like myself and maybe Joe who who look at this as this is my childhood. This is a a dynasty. This is a legacy. Don't fuck it up. Yeah, I don't think they did. Yeah, and I, I, I think JJ delivered big time. Yeah, he yeah. Did. I think he did well. He did very uh, well, not without his plot holes, not without it, his discrepancies. Right. But that's with any movie. You're never gonna make oh, a yeah. perfect Star Wars movie. You're never but, gonna make yeah. a perfect movie. Period. Yeah. I mean, well, you clearly haven't seen Flubber. Yeah, <laughs> Robin Williams is beyond reproach oh in any God. movie. He's in, so thank you very much. All right, another another common criticism uh, that hand oh, hand Jesus Hans death <laughs> Hans death was whoa predict- whoa 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 wait Hans dead? Did you not see this movie? <laughs> 
<laughs> that, you were you were doing so well up until that point. I was I, pretty sure you oh, saw it. So I went and I saw the, a pre-screening because I'm lucky to work somewhere that seems to have an in with everything. So we got to see it like the day before it came out. And ah, we got out fantastic. and you could see the big lineup of people waiting to get in, dressed in their costumes, sitting on the floor waiting. And I, as I was coming out, I was like, man, I could just really make a lot of people hate me and just <laughs> blurt it out. Walk out and say, holy fuck, I can't believe Han died. Yeah. <laughs> If that happened, I wouldn't be here today, but... No. And none of us would, would really uh, regret that, because that's a bad thing. Don't do that. Oh. It's been a hilarious story. <laughs> but at any rate... Hilarious, the, hilarious the criticism... story. I'm telling it from his hospital bed. <laughs> but the... He can't chew solid food anymore. But the criticism here is that Han's death was predictable and poorly executed. Yeah. Thoughts? Oh, yeah. no. 1,000% agree. Really? Yeah. Man, me and you like opposite sides again. This How... Is a... How could you not see that coming? Oh my God! There's it, Kylo I Ren. I didn't see it. I'm not gonna say I didn't see it coming. And by that, I knew something was going to happen. I didn't necessarily know Han was gonna die. But to I think it was done. I thought it was done very well. It was a very emotional scene that emotional, I think. Emotional, yes. I mean, Cliche. As they, double yes. As they were walking out onto the platform <laughs> that had no railings, because who uses railings in this space age world of holograms? As he's walking out there, you know something's going to happen. Oh, the second that but you see that stupid up to bridge. It, like, I didn't think anything of it. Oh, like, that's... until that scene, I was not sure if Han, like, if he would live or die. I thought it was going to be a thing. As soon as he stepped out onto that thing, onto that walkway, I'm like, yep, you're beat. You're dead. There, you know, I, I, I do have a two-part answer to this. Was, was his death predictable? Yes. Mm-hmm. Somebody was going to die. There was going to be some kind of tragedy was it going to be Han? Was it going to, was it not going to be Han? I wasn't sure. Poorly yeah. executed? I don't think so. Yeah. Because, and the reason why I say that is because as he's there, as he's going towards Kylo Ren and they're having that conversation and Kylo Ren kind of half-heartedly puts his lightsaber in Han's hands, I'm thinking, well, maybe there is a second where, you know, there's some kind of redemption or maybe there won't be and he'll let him go or something. Uh. So, I mean, yeah, was he going to die? Yeah, probably. Did I think it was going to happen like that? I didn't think so. I did not. Um, so I, did not I, think I don't think – I don't think it was poorly executed, but I, I guess I, I could see the point to where it was predictable. Yeah. The second I saw that bridge, I'm like, someone's going to die. The second yeah. I saw Kylo Ren, I'm like, Han's going to fucking die. And then Chewie's <laughs> going to go ape shit. The movie that 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 walkway was there strictly so someone could fall off of it. That's exactly Put what that railings was. up. You know what? You're right. You're right. Anytime we see one of those bridges, one of those railings, one of those whatevers that are highly suspended up, someone always winds up falling off mm-hmm. every time. OSHA would have a field day with these places. I'm telling you. Right. <laughs> like just one railing. Even those wooden, even those wooden bridges across a cav- uh, uh, like a chasm, have a rope. Just <laughs> something. Come on. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, when it comes down to it, though, I mean, a lot of the major, like, outside of character developments, I feel like the plot development is going to be predictable in a, in a number of ways. I mean, I I predict, and we can do this again when the next movie comes out, Yeah, some shit's going down, Kylo Ren is going to reluctantly join the good guys, he's going to join them, and they're going to fuck up Snoke, and all, spoil all his plans... And that's going to happen. Well, Han's not coming back. We all think he's going to Jon Snow the way out of there. There's no way he's, he's alive. <laughs> well, if they like to maybe he'll come back as the blue ghost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, there's. I mean, I, I agree. There's the plot's going to be a predictable point because when you make when you make overarching stories like this with a story that is like Star Wars, there's going to be some some points that you're always going to hit. Otherwise, you're going to tell a bad movie. You can't have the bad guy win, or at least you can't have him win definitively because. That's a bad movie. No one's going to want to see that movie where Snoke kills everybody and he's just like, look at me with all my minions. No one's going to want to see that. Eventually, he's going to get defeated. Will someone take his place? Perhaps. Will it be Kylo Ren? It might be. He's already power hungry. He's you know, going between the light and the dark side. And he had that whole speech with his dad about he's just using you. So why not get rid of him once you have what you want? It's possible. See, so stuff like that, I don't know. Maybe it's true. I think he might have to fight Leia. And she's gonna send him to his room. <laughs> but it's, I mean, I mean, I imagine there's gonna be some sort of confrontation between him and his mom at some point, and I don't know that he'll survive that. I think emotionally, she's gonna wa- I don't think he'll survive that because, yeah, that was his dad. He had issues with his dad, but 
that's your mom, man. So, um, so then again, I, I'll ask the same question. Did it detract from the movie or not? Han's death? The Han's death being predictable yeah. and poorly executed. For me, I, well, one, it was predictable only as soon as he stepped out onto the ledge. Um, poorly executed, I don't agree with that whatsoever. I thought but, it was different, and I don't think it took away from the movie. Marcel? Um, uh, as a Star Wars fan, I would come to expect that Han's death would have been a little bit better than that. Uh, for whatever reason. I don't know what it would have been, but, uh, you know, being lied to by your son, I mean, yes, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching, tear-inducing, I'll give you all of that. But that whole setup was super cheesy, and <laughs> I think that Han Solo deserved a better death. I Did it detract from the movie? I mean, as far as plot lines go, it furthered the plot just fine. Someone had to die, and and... There needed to be a way to to make Kylo Ren weaker so he could be defeated at the end, and why not have Chewbacca's bow bow shot, whatever it's called, bowcaster shoot him to to make him to, to to make him weaker. I I don't know. I it doesn't detract from the overarching story. It it is a pretty small thing, and as far as characters go, I don't like it. I think that it was predictable. I don't think it was executed well. There could have been a number of different ways this could have happened. But uh, as far as the story goes, I think it worked fine. For, for me, though, I have to, I have to disagree with that, uh, that Han deserved a better death. Because Han is a smuggler. You think he's going to die in a big shootout. That's the way that smugglers die. He's been in the midst of war. He's been on the front lines. You expect him to go down as a soldier or as a or as a smart ass or a badass, he went down as a father trying to save his son. And that was something we did not expect of, for Han to fall from. And I think that's why, for me, it worked. Because at the end, he didn't even probably do it for himself. Because there was that moment where you were like, yeah, he's probably not going to go to him, but Leia asked him to. So he goes out there as a father, not as a smuggler, not as a general, not as, not as badass Han Solo. He goes out there as a father trying to save his son. And I, it doesn't work for him, <laughs> obviously. But I will um, say, I, I will say though that it, I think I think it was really good. I think it, for me it was a like <gasps> kind of moment, like oh yeah. my god, that just fucking happened. Yeah. The only thing that kind of ruined it for me was he kind of like had that like stroke out kind of face as he was like falling to his death. So I'm like, oh, you got stabbed with a lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. It looked like he could have like had a, I don't know, better expression. Or All right, something. we'll stab you with a lightsaber, and we'll see the expression you make. Uh, he just looked yeah. like he was stroking out, and that was kind of weird to me. And I was like, they, well, uh. that that did they did do well in that, in that he he didn't die a ah or you, you killed me. It was oh, yeah. he didn't die so much no. from the wound as much as he did from the heartbreak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. also the fall probably had something to do with it and then the planet exploding <laughs> probably didn't help but yeah, yeah but he he's still alive <laughs> yeah he's not coming back, <laughs> he ain't coming back. <laughs> no one on that planet is coming back they're all dead but i mean i, I think for me that's the re that's why i have to disagree because i don't think han could have had a better death he could have died in a more predictable way as his character of course he could have died in in the millennium falcon he could have died at any number of things that could have happened uh, in the in a shootout but he didn't and I think that is that was a good mark on their part to not have him go out in a predictable manner like that. When we said predictable before, we knew he was he was dead or something was going to happen to him the moment he walked out onto that very rickety, very thin walkway. We knew that. But that was the only part of that that was predictable. Up to that point, I wasn't sure Han was going to die. I didn't think – I thought maybe – maybe we'll have a happy ending and someone will have – he'll go back to Leia and it'll be fun. But – to have him go out that way, I think, was a very fitting end for that character because it made him more than he was originally. He wasn't just this this badass space guy. He was a father and a husband and was trying to do the right thing in in a way that he normally wouldn't have. He could have gone in guns blazing, possibly wounded him, taken him back to the ship, some something, you know, but he didn't. And I think that was a really good... I think I just I really enjoyed that part because they right. did something different with him. All right. Well, uh, what do you say we move on to uh, the final rating of this thing? A um, couple of points I want to make before we submit our ratings for uh, 
the audience. I I don't know. I had I had a better phrase in mind, and it just <laughs> gone. Um, so uh, the Force Awakens. We're in uh, today. We're in the middle of June, and uh, it 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 just finished its theater run like last week, which means this sucker has been in theaters for like six months. Wait, it was still in theaters for you guys like last week? Yeah, well, I not around it on here. Blu-ray like last month. I know. I don't think it's. I don't think it was still in theaters around here. I'm just saying, uh, generally worldwide, I think it oh, was yeah, still yeah. showing up until about last week. Um, so the movie had a 306 million dollar production budget. This movie made 937 million domestic, worldwide top 2.06 billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, it did. It's a lot of goddamn money. Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh at 92 percent has an 89 percent audience score. Let's give this uh, a scale of five cups of blue milk. <laughs> Why is it blue? I don't. It's, yeah, I don't know. They, because on milk. Tatooine, it's blue. It's blue okay. milk. Like, like, okay, like out of five blue milks. Out of five blue milks. Okay, go ahead. What? I, I'm going to give it a five. I loved it. I loved everything about it. Um, I'm looking forward to the next movies to explain more about what happened and how this uh, world got established. As a non-Star Wars fan, I give it a five. I'm excited to see the next movie. As a I Star did not, Wars I could fan. not say that <laughs> on the previous movies. <laughs> I will – I'll give it a, a solid four. All right. Solid All right. four blue milks. It was a good movie. It was entertaining. It was visually stunning. They used a lot of really great practical effects. Uh, in the realm of Star Wars movie, although, I mean, it, it was good, but there are better Star Wars movies. And that movie could have been better in, in different ways. But I mean, looking at it from holistically from, as a movie, it, it did really well. But I think as a Star Wars fan and being loyal to the, the canon the canon in the universe and everything that came before it, I, I give it a four. All right. All right. Valid opinion. And that, <laughs> that's that. And that's, uh, that's our review on uh, star Wars, the force awakens. Yay. Yes. So what do you guys, so what do you guys, what's coming up that you guys are looking forward to? I want to um, watch Zootopia. Zootopia. <laughs> really? Yeah. You know that that killed opening weekend. Uh, Jason Bateman I, is pretty awesome, and the the chick from Once Upon a Time is in it. It's pretty cool. It looks hilarious. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll give it that one. I'm looking forward to uh, Now You See Me too. I really enjoyed that first movie, so uh, I'm pretty excited for that one to be coming out this week. Um, I haven't seen any of the trailers, but I saw the I saw a poster for it, and I'm like, yes, I will go see that all day long. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm pretty excited for that coming out. Um. As as we're talking about Star Wars, I got to say I – now my mind's just all on Star Wars. So I got to say that I am very much looking forward to uh, Rogue One coming out at the end of this year. Oh, it's too yeah. early. Too early to get, I know, to get excited. I know. <laughs> I know it's Still too early, it up, man. but I just saw, I saw the one trailer. I know they just went in for reshoots. I know they did, but as I just saw the one trailer, and I was like, oh, my God, this is the Star Wars story that I've always wanted to see. So I am just – yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. Yes, I know it's six months down the line, but I am very much hyped about it. I, I am on that hype train. You're allowed to be excited. I'm excited about stuff all the time. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Tell us what you're excited about. Tell us on the Twitters. How can we get you? How can they get us? Yes. Oh, they can get us at Facebook. You go to facebook.com backslash fantastic reviews podcast. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Our handle is uh, fantastic podcast, but it's spelled P O D C S T because there weren't enough letters in, in <laughs> campaign. Um, <laughs> if you want to email us, our email address is fantastic reviews podcast at gmail.com. Dot com. Dot com. So, uh, you know, drop us a line. Tell us what you're excited about. Tell us what you like about our review, what you agree with, what you didn't agree with. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have uh, some recaps and some upcoming podcasts. Yeah. So, Yay uh, for arguments. So I think that's I think that's about it from us. Do you guys have any uh, last thoughts to add? Nope. Um. What's the back to what my mind is doing right now? Got, <laughs> you uh, know what? No, my last thought is maybe next time I'll pay more attention to know which movie we're reviewing this time. <laughs> <laughs> I totally thought it was Deadpool. 
That might have been my fault. I, I have a tendency to mix things up. <laughs> anyway, well, thanks for listening, everybody. We've been a uh, uh, fantastic reviews podcast, and uh, we will see you next time. Keep fit and have fun. <laughs>